original high priest called, at least under the Iran, what we would call the Old Testament covenant uh, during that time. And we talk about how that uh, he was specifically chosen by God and then his descendants to fulfill that uh, place of service of going into the Holy of Holies, the once a year Aaron did, to uh, sprinkle the blood upon the altar there upon the mercy seat for the sins of the people. and But also before he did that, of course, we talked about this. We looked back over in Leviticus uh, and some other scriptures that talked about how that he had to make sacrifice for himself also. So he was not the perfect high priest. He was simply a shadow of he who was to come. But that because he did come among, from among the people and was a man like unto them, then he could have compassion upon them uh, because he was subject to weakness also, as the scripture there said. Uh, and that he was required because of that, because of his own sinful nature, his own sinfulness, to uh, make sacrifice for himself. And then in very importantly, the last verse there, I think, in that section, in verse 4, that no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. This was not a thing that Aaron took upon himself. This was not something that he told Moses, hey, I think that I will be the high priest. I think I can handle this job. No. This was of God's choosing. This was of God's calling. And it's just as it is now in, in the preaching and the teaching and of God's Word and in pastoral ministry, God calls. God chooses. We talked about... Isaiah, we talked about Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee, and I ordained you to be a prophet. There. Talk about the, the twelve apostles. Talk about the apostle Paul. There were men chosen, called out by God. They were chosen vessels for him and for his servants. Servants. And this is how God does it. Only God calls, only God chooses for his service. But we come to this section of Scripture today, and the writer of Hebrews switches here from the calling of men to service to Christ, and Christ as high priest. So he says here, Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. He makes a comparison here. And he quotes then two Old Testament passages which uh, Brother Wayne did the, uh, didn't know he was doing me a favor but he read Psalm 2 this morning during his Sunday school lesson. So then this morning in the second part which is where the second part of this comes from verse 6 comes from Psalm 110 that I read this morning. We'll get to those later and talk more extensively about those but as we've said before, that the writer of Hebrews extensively uses Old Testament scriptures in this. Primarily, really, the Psalms. And there are many Psalms that speak of Christ that are Messianic Psalms. We may get around to someday uh, talking about that list of Messianic prophecies in the Psalms, but there are many of them. But... He says here, he says, he did not glorify, being Christ, not glorify himself to become high priest. Now what does that mean? Well, as Aaron did not take this honor upon himself, but was called and appointed by God to fulfill this office, in a very similar sense, Christ was appointed by God the Father to this office. That's a glorious office. It's an office of glory, but it's an office also of humility, of service. But as far as we can tell, Aaron did not take glory in it either. Neither did Christ. We're going to see, however, later, a great, as far as comparisons, we're making comparisons here, the far superiority of the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word for glorify here means to glorify, to honor, and to praise. Now, Jesus, in His service here on the earth, did not glorify Himself. He did not 
praise himself. He did not honor himself. He did not confer this upon himself. This glory and this honor was conferred upon him by the Father. Look back at the book, the Gospel of John this morning. Look back at John chapter 8 and there in verse 54. John chapter 8 and verse 54. And of course this is a confrontation that Jesus here was having with some of the Jews, very often Pharisees. But it says in verse 54, Jesus answered, he's answering their questions. And they said, are you greater than our father Abraham? Well, yes, actually, he is. <laughs> Who is dead? The prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? I'm going to tell you who I make myself out to be. I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that He is your God. You see here, He's saying, the one that you call God as Father, He is my Father. And of course, and down in verse 58, later on, Jesus got into really hot water with the Jews when he said most assuredly or truly truly I say to you before Abraham was I am making himself on an equal par with God the Father of course they wanted to kill him at that point but it was not his time but what he is saying is my father who honors me or it is my father who glorifies me same word here it is my father who glorifies me of whom you say that he is your God Look back farther on in John's Gospel, chapter 17, and then the Jesus High Priestly Prayer. There in the first verse, it says, Jesus spoke these words and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. What? Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. So the glory that Christ, any glory that Christ had here upon earth, came from the Father. Came from the Father. He did not come to glorify Himself. He came as a servant to give His life a ransom for many, as the Scripture says. Remember, we quoted also here recently from John chapter 11. And there in verse 4, when He heard that Lazarus was sick, He said that this sickness is not unto death, but what for the glory of God, what that the Son of God may be glorified through it. I'm not seeking to glorify myself, but this is for to glorify me. This is going to glorify me. And of course, He was glorified in it. But it drew uh, affirmation to the fact of the glory of God. That it again points out that Jesus did not try to glorify Himself here upon earth. And I, as I was studying this and looking at this, my thoughts went back to when Jesus was baptized. And, uh, you don't have to turn to this, but over there in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17, and it says that when, when he was baptized, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending uh, like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Father attested, This is my Son. Honor him. Glorify him. But Jesus did not say, Glorify me to those around him. The glory of the Son comes from the Father alone. Comes from the Father alone. And Jesus said, I have not come to do my own will, but the will of one of the Father. And so the Father, if there's any glory upon the Son, it comes from the Father. Now, some things we don't quite understand because we attest and know that Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Father are equal in deity, equal in holiness, equal in eternalness. That's a word. <laughs> Eternality. Maybe that's a better word. But yes, Jesus in certain ministers the eternal Son of God, but His office and His glory were conferred upon Him by the Father, prophet and priest and king. He was prophet, he was priest, and king. But of course, His office and His calling are far superior to the office and calling of Aaron. And this is really what the writer of Hebrews here 
as he's as he's writing to these Hebrews, he's getting them to see it, to reaffirm again and again. And we've said, what is the theme of Hebrews? The superiority of Christ in every way. <coughs> he is the most superior prophet, most superior priest, and of course, King, King Jesus. And so. We have to understand, he's trying to get, I believe that he's saying again, reaffirming Aaron's calling and of his descendants, which basically ended in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, Jerusalem was wiped out in 70 AD there, that that was just a shadow. Aaron's office, Aaron's calling, all of that was a shadow of Christ to reveal Christ. We need to remember that. The shadows are not superior to the reality. <laughs> the reality is Jesus. <laughs> the true priesthood, the superior priesthood is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to get more into this even more deeply when we get a couple of chapters down the road in Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to be able to talk about, about the priesthood of Christ. But we have to touch upon it here. We have to look upon this here. And so... What the writer of Hebrews is to show the superiority of Christ's priesthood, he quotes to these two Old Testament passages. Psalm 2 and verse 7 and Psalm 110 and verse 4. Now you might kind of keep a finger over there in the Psalms because I'm going to be making some references here to these two Psalms. The reason here. Both of these passages, as I said, are messianic in nature. Both of them. We're very familiar with the one in Psalm 2, perhaps more so than in Psalm 110. They both speak of the eternal sonship, I believe, of Christ. You look there in uh, Psalm 2. It said, you know, the he who sits in the heavens, and you look about this back up there to the verse 2, it says the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, let me point something out here. That's not really, I don't know that I didn't even really notice it, but I came across it in my study today. And we talked about this actually in Brother Wayne's Sunday School this morning. What is the, the word in the New Testament that we have for anointed? His anointed. Christ. Christos. Well, if you notice here, when the writer of Hebrews is addressing and talking about this issue in verse 5, he didn't say, so also Jesus did not glorify himself to become high priest, but he says also Christ, <laughs> the anointed, did not glorify himself to become high priest. And that was no accident that he said that. That's not an accident. He did that purposely. Because then he goes on to Speak here of God the Father's anointed. If the, the nations rage against God the Father and His anointed. It was going on back then, it's still going on. Men are raging against God. They want to stamp out the, the image of God. And all, all of these things that we have nowadays about, well, we need to take God out of the public arena and out of the government and all of these kind of things. And, and, you know, we have political campaigns. Oh, we need to start a petition and all of these kind of things about we, you know. Let me be honest with you. I don't get wrapped up in all of that. I don't get wrapped up in it. What we're to be wrapped up in as Christians is the proclamation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, we should expect this. <laughs> this should not be unexpected as our nation and our world, in a large sense, becomes more secular and anti-God, that men are going to rage against God. <laughs> you know, if they take in godly trust off the money one of these days or off of symbols, that's not to be unexpected. But let me say this, they will not take God out of the world. Right. He will still dwell in His people. His word shall still be present in this word, in this world. His Holy Spirit will be here until He comes again. Amen. Hallelujah. So, hey, amen. So, 
If they take his name and God we trust out, we're still going to pray. We're still going to preach Jesus. Right. We're still going to proclaim the gospel Amen. in this world. But how did I get off on that? <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I don't take rabbit trails very often. But he is the anointed one. You look at you know. I remember if you think about in John's gospel. Jesus, as we remember, had a conversation with a Samaritan woman. Oh, my word. Jesus. The disciples came back. You know, they had gone off to find some food. They came back, came back and found him talking to a Samaritan woman. Goodness gracious. Jesus, this is a Samaritan. She's, she's like, oh, uh, the Jews considered them a mockery race. Not even worthy to be even, to be even encountered. They would go out of their way trying to not walk through Samaria. You know what? She was one of Jesus' sheep. Right. He had this conversation with her, and he's having, he's talking to her, and uh, you know, he points out to her, "You've had five husbands. Uh, not only was she Samaritan, she wasn't a woman of great reputation." He said, "The man you have now is not your husband." But uh, she learned quickly that this was no ordinary man. She says in verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. Who is called the anointed. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus says to her, guess what? <laughs> I am speaking to you and me now. Now I stop. I try to put myself sometimes in that place. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? That this one that you have heard of who is the Christ, who is the Messiah, who is God the Father's anointed one, you're having a conversation with Him. And then you come on farther down there to verse 29, and she, after it says, she forgot about her water. She's going to the well to get water. She forgot about it. She left her water pot and went her way to the city and said to the man, come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Could this be the Christ? Anointed one. Well, absolutely, he was the Christ. He was the Christ. This was the anointed one spoken of over here in Psalm 2. Spoken of here. And Aaron's anointing, you know, was just temporary. It was for the service. But Christ's anointing is for all eternity. For all life. So Christ is the anointed one of the Father. But also at the same time, not only the anointed one of the Father, He says, I will declare the decree back there in Psalm 2, the Lord, Yahweh, has said to me, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. That doesn't mean that He birthed Him, but He was the first in all the order of creation. We'll get into some other things later. But anyway, but He's His Son. He is, as we've already read from the Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. This is my son. This is him. Hear him. Of course, Jesus said back again in John 17 and verse 5 that now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before what the world was. Before the world was. And that glory, he had the same glory of the Father that they had it together. And now you can go, if you want to, look at Psalm 110. This is the one we read this morning. Again, this is another Messianic psalm. The wording is important here. The Lord said to my Lord, this is a psalm of David, but David's not talking about his son. He's not talking about, you know, Lord Yahweh said to my Lord, I don't mind. Sit at my right hand, but what is the right hand? It's the power. It's the place of power. It's the place of authority. Till I make your enemies your footstool. And we go on farther down to verse 5, and he says, There the Lord is at your right hand. Again, Adonai, he shall execute kings, the day of his wrath. Well, we see that 
Jesus spoke about that and spoken about in the, the New Testament epistles. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. Jesus said that, that the Father has committed all judgment to the Son. He shall fill the place with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He, he's, he's the Son and He's the King. Shows His equality with the Father. Shows Him as King and Ruler. And this is what if you go uh, over to Matthew chapter 22. There in verse 44. He's having a conversation, Jesus says, with the disciples. He's talking about this very passage of Scripture right here. He says, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them. He's usually the Pharisees were coming and questioning Jesus. They were trying to catch him in some contradiction. But Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? In other words, what do you think about God the Father's anointed one? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the Spirit call him Lord? Hmm. How does David do that? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. See, they didn't have an answer for that. The answer was standing right in front of them. Father had said to the Son, Jesus Christ, sit in my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Then you go on on the uh, day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and uh, baptized the, the church with power there. In that whole section, verses 22 through 36, Peter preaches a sermon about Jesus there. Men of Israel hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested what? By God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands. You crucified, you put him to death. But God raised him up. Having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, and then he Quotes here were the Psalms. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for I will not leave your my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life and made me full of joy in your presence. Quoting from Psalm 16. So he begins to speak of the patriarch David. He says here, therefore, being a prophet. David was a prophet, too. Uh, David was a prophet. Not just a king, but a prophet. Knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, David, God gave him a revelation. Out of the fruit of your body, there's going to be one that's going to come that's going to rule and reign eternally. It's not Solomon. Uh, it's not him. That he would raise up the Christ, the anointed one, to sit on his throne. He foreseen this, spoke concerning the resurrection of what? Again, the Christ, the anointed one. This Jesus that you guys killed. Uh, I started to say tried to kill, they did kill him, but God raised him up. He's the one. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. But God didn't leave his soul in. Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus was raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. He's doing this. He's doing this. David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself. <laughs> David didn't ascend into the heavens. The Lord Jesus Christ, He's ascended, He's risen from the grave. And you've seen Him. Five hundred witnesses have seen. He went back and He ascended to the Father. He said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Yeah, I wonder when Jesus 
ascended back to the Father. This is what the Father said. He quoted this verse of Scripture. I believe so. Sit down, son. Sit down until I tell you to go back and make your enemies your footstool. He said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's Lord. He's ruler. He's king. He's also the anointed one. This one who is the anointed one is not only a king, but he's also a priest. He's also a priest. He is our eternal priest, he says, after according to the order of Melchizedek in verse 4. He says, you're a priest forever. And that word there, forever, what does that mean? Well, it means forever. <laughs> Means eternal, perpetual, without end. Now, one of the things that's interesting is I, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever really thought about this deeply. One of the things is I was coming across this to note is that the book of Hebrews is the only place where the priesthood of Christ is taught extensively. Not the only place that it's mentioned, but the only place taught extensively. You know, Paul touches on it in Romans 8, 34, about intercession, being our intercessor. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. It just touches upon it. doesn't teach upon it extensively. That's really another evidence probably that Paul, you know, some people think Paul wrote this, but I don't think Paul did. I mean, if Paul did, I think he would have certainly taught extensively on the priesthood in one of the other epistles, but that wasn't God's purpose. He had other things to teach and to cover. Neither John or Peter taught upon it either. But who is this Melchizedek? Who is Melchizedek? Not very much reference to him, basically. But you've got to go back to the Old Testament to Genesis chapter 14. Look back at Genesis chapter 14. In verses 17 through 20, we're going to read this one in this. This is about after Abram had gone and rescued Lot. Remember that? Lot got in trouble. Fancy that. Got himself where he shouldn't have been, probably. And, 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 and uh, Abram went and rescued him. But after his rescue, it says, And the king of Sodom, in verse 17, went out to meet him at the valley of Shabbat, that is, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him. Then, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. The God who had called Abram out of a foreign land. It says, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be the Abram, be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all. People want to talk about the tithing was under the law. No, actually, it was before, it looks like here. But Abram, who had been called out of uh, idol worship, area of what we would call Persia and those areas there was called out. This is the God Most High that had called him out and this one was the priest of God Most High. Very interesting. We know very little about it. Everything that we know is speculation. Other than this passage, and then you go over to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3, it talks about that he was without father and mother. <laughs> what does that mean? You go over to Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 13, talking about prophecy about future time. It talks there about not Melchizedek by name, but talks about a king upon a throne who is also a priest. Very interesting things to note here. You know what Salem is in the Old Testament? The ancient name for Jerusalem. It is the ancient name for Jerusalem. He was the ruler of Jerusalem. In 
And some speculated, well, this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Maybe. We don't know. We've talked about this before in our Bible studies, more, you know, or in discussions among ourselves. If you don't know something for sure, then you shouldn't state dogmatically uh, anything about it. So the only thing I can state dogmatically about it is we don't really know who he was. Except for the fact that he was the priest of the Most High God. We know that his priesthood preceded Aaron's. God, we can assume, established him as high priest. I would say his priesthood is superior to Aaron's because it was before that and it says, I'm certain of this, that God called him out. Whoever this Melchizedek was, as Christ uh, preceded Aaron, of course his eternal mouth. His priesthood is eternal as the scripture here teaches. It says after the manner, the fashion of Melchizedek. And that's one of those, folks, that's one of those mysteries of scripture that we do not know who he is. Maybe when we get to glory, we will know. I don't know. Or maybe it won't matter because it's all going to be about Christ at that particular point anyway. We're not going to care who Melchizedek was. The purpose of the writer of Hebrews here in this passage is to show the superiority of Christ's priesthood. That it precedes Aaron's and that it is not temporal, but his priesthood is eternal. As believers, when we pray, pray with confidence, we pray with boldness, because not only is He our priest who intercedes for us, but He's also our King and our Lord and our Sovereign who rules and reigns in our lives. And what we know that He hears, and how He, and we know that He does hear, that He has the power to do. He has the power to answer our prayers. Aaron, his priesthood, well, he could go and he could ask God, you know, to forgive the sins of the people, to make intercession, I mean, to, to make that intercession there by sprinkling the blood, but he didn't have the power to give forgiveness. The Christ, the anointed one, does. The prophet, the priest, the King Jesus. And that's what we take refuge in as the children of God. This is what we have confidence in, is that our Savior, He's also a king. He's also a priest. He intercedes for us eternally until we go back to be with him. And what a great reassurance that is. What great boldness that we sh that should give us when we come to his throne. And I hope this morning as we go all through this passage, and we're going to stop here this morning, that we will take confidence and boldness and comfort in this. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the assurance that our Christ, who has saved our souls by his own shed blood, and who has sent the Holy Spirit here to be the seal of salvation upon us until the day that we are redeemed in our glorified bodies. Heavenly Father, we we do pray, Father. We do thank you for him. We thank you for him. We thank you for what he has done for us. May that encourage us in the, in the coming days. May, may, our, may our hearts be uplifted every day this week as we, as we go through this week and the, and the days ahead as long as you give us in our sojourn here upon earth. Father, may you help us to be assured, to have assurance of our Christ and what he has done and what he is doing for us. Thank you, Father, for Christ, the solid rock, the fairest Lord Jesus. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. May we stand.